Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure for being, being here. It's my sec second time, third time as a speaker. Thanks, Larry, for the invitation. So I, I'd like to take you for the first part of my presentation, maybe the first 10 minutes, into a little bit of a, a historic, I would say, historical journey where uh, how we in cancer, cancer epidemiologists, we uh, collectively have been thinking about what causes cancer and uh, which models uh, we should uh, use to understand what causes cancer. Um, let me get it right, right. So this is a starting point which for many was uh, the end point, in fact, during most of the past century, you know, since uh, in experimental models, uh, uh, Japanese researchers learned to cause skin cancer by spreading uh, um, <coughs> a tar on, uh, on, uh, on, on skin mouse, uh, on, on, uh, on mouse skin. Basically, everything uh, little by little built up to understand that there are chemicals and there are some physical uh, substances uh, that can damage, now we understand uh, uh, since some time we damage DNA in various ways. There was the one stage model, two stage model, sequential models. And all this is very solid science. And uh, later on, uh, uh, there was some understanding that also viruses uh, uh, and then uh, I would say microbiological agents can be the starting point uh, of, uh, of development of cancer and, uh, and parasites, actually schistosoma was depicted by, by the Egyptian because there is the little man urinating blood, isn't it? And, uh, and obviously ionizing, uh, ionizing radiation. So all this is the knowledge that has been built progressively. And, uh, there is another parallel line of research. Uh, sorry, basically this led to one conclusion that is in, we see every day in the, in the, in the late journals uh, is that cancer is caused by carcinogen, almost by definition. So I'll try to, to uh, convince you, maybe, or convince is not the right word, to guide you through a, a thinking by which many of us now think that cancer may originate without the need of any chemical, physical, or, or biological carcinogen or radiation. There was a parallel line of research. This is, uh, I'm citing this because I read the original articles, <laughs> that goes back to the very beginning of the century, actually in the early uh, 19, between 1904 and uh, 1920, there was a lot of research on transplanted uh, tumors. Was the only people didn't know how to create, uh, uh, originate a tumor in an animal, but they were transplanting uh, original uh, tumors. So uh, rodents who were in calorie restricted diet had a reduced, uh, uh, reduced. Uh, um, acceptance of no tumor. Raus got the Nobel Prize, but not for this. He got the Nobel Prize for, for the, uh, called, what is called the aviarian sarcomas. He, he, he was able to transfer uh, the, let's say, let's say, the liquid from a, a sarcoma from a, from a chicken, basically, to another chicken. And that, 50 years later or 60 years later, was taken as the first demonstration of viral carcinogenesis. Um, then Tannenbaum came in and, uh, and did a huge number of studies. He was in Chicago, a pathologist in the, in the 40s. Fantastic study with hundreds of, uh, of rodents uh, showing that uh, restricted uh, energy in the low-fat diet was uh, associated with the reduced yield of tumor. There were a first case control study done by actually two uh, female researchers, uh, uh, Percy Stocks and, and that Mary, Mary Ken, who, who, who actually died not long time ago, in the, uh, and there was a very nice obituary some time ago about her work. Uh, they, they showed that uh, most likely uh, a diet rich in fruit and vegetables and uh, low intake of alcohol was associated with a reduced risk of developing uh, cancer of the digestive tract. And, uh, and the same Tannenbaum 
was asked by MetLife Insurance to do a huge, huge, now we say epidemiological studies on hundreds of thousands of people who had a, a MetLife Insurance in the 30s. Because somebody who was not a scientist working in, the, in an accountant got the observed, because they had weight of people, that people with more heavy weight uh, seem to be, to be uh, I mean, the family, obviously, claiming a, a premium for, for death, for life insurance, more often than people who were slim. Can you imagine somebody sitting somewhere in, in an office in New York? They go, called in the, 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 the great scientists, the great scientists analyzed the MetLife data and also the data of other uh, insurance. And there is a fantastic report, 1936, that says very clearly there is an almost linear relationship between uh, increased deaths for cancer and cardiovascular diseases associated with weight, with, ex with overweight and obesity. So in a way, we could have stopped there. 1936, everything was already solved. This is just an example of Tannenbaum work where he reproduced this uh, enormously in the 40s and the 50s. He also invented the model by which a fixed le level of energy intake, uh, mice are offered a, re a little uh, uh, will to spin, and those who have the will and spin and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, spend more energy have less cancer. And then he also put uh, a two different temperatures, those are shriving because of the uh, colder temperature, have less cancer for the same level of energy intake. So one could have said, by 1955, we knew everything we wanted to know about uh, energy balance and cancer, but this was completely forgotten. Because you know, in science, we all know how it is. We, go, we tend to go mainstream. And those who don't go mainstream, maybe you know, they're parked there and, and so on. So all this idea that cancer might be influenced by what now we call metabolic factors, was there and disappeared. The way I actually started my research career working on chemical carcinogenesis, I work on lung cancer and how lung cancer may be related to exposure to chromium, vanadium, and obviously uh, smoking and the about 40 or 50 carcinogens that are in smoking. So I come from the chemical carcinogenesis research. But sometime around the 80s, 1980s, which may be a long time ago for some of us, but maybe yesterday for some of us, uh, is, was everything came to a big crunch. Because thanks to the World Health Organization and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, we started having data on cancer incidents around the world, and the very good data, top data, collected by specialized structures that are called population-based cancer registries. The first ever such structure was created in Connecticut, the second in Denmark in the 40s. And then, little by little, the world has been covered by this population-based cancer registry. And, and the picture that came out was, to some extent, reassuring, because for the cancer for which we know something, uh, the distribution around the planet corresponded to what we know about the causes. For other cancer was big, big embarrassment. So I'll just show you three or four or five slides as examples. So the obvious example where everything fits and we know we can explain, I would say, everything, sounds pretentious, but it's everything, is lung cancer. By knowing, you know, the, the past 30 years of smoking, by knowing about how smoking went up, went down, the type of cigarettes, blonde tobacco, black tobacco, filter, non-filter, we can explain everything down to the change of histological types that you know, used to be squamous cell carcinoma prevalent, adenocarcinoma less. Now is more adenocarcinoma because of light of, uh, of uh, ultra-filter cigarette. Therefore, you know, deep inhalation, the carcinogens go to the peripheral, peripheral part of, of the lung where lung where get adenocarcinoma. So we are down to explaining everything. And we are also happy. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong slide. This is it. All these differences are explained and, and perfectly. So we feel nice, well. We can also 
perfectly explain the rise and the decrease in lung cancer incidence, exactly uh, uh, you know, uh, following the up and down trend of cigarette uh, sales in the world. We can also say that there are some parts of the planet that so far have not been completely, you know, uh, this is particularly India and so on, not yet touched by the epidemic. So here we are fine, sorry. A completely different cancer, liver cancer, which has a very much, much, much higher incidence. You see, it's something like eight, nine, fold, eight hundred percent more common in China and some part of Africa and some part of uh, South America, and 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 basic and, and with huge trends is coming down in USA, is going up, and and basically with HBV, hepatitis C virus, hepatitis B virus prevalence and diffusion by age and man and so on, alcohol and more recently obesity, we can understand where it comes from. And then the US is going up for obesity. And China is coming down because of the prevalence of the virus is decreasing. Another one where again, we potentially we can say basically we know everything is melanoma because it's the comple complex combination of one environmental factor and one genetic factor which is the type, score, colors, and fairness of, of the skin. And, and basically, the conclusion is that Europeans with their fair skin moved around the planet in places where they, they have not been genetically selected to live in, <laughs> and they get exposed to a level of, of, uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, everyday sunshine, you know, that is not what what was their uh, local, let's say, uh, uh, selective factor from a genetic point of view. And, and, and these are examples of how melanoma has been going up, and it's not because there is more. This is not a global warming effect. I mean, it's not that Denmark has become very, very sunny, clearly, and Iceland and Norway and Scotland. It's just because lifestyle has changed and people go and get exposed. To, to sunshine in uh, different places uh, uh, around the planet, but is a, a gigantic increase. I mean, we are talking about a 20-fold increase in incidence of melanoma in our, uh, well, in, certainly in my lifetime. <laughs> so it's, so, but again, we know where it comes from. Now, when you go to breast cancer, then we start scratching our heads because Despite a lot of blah blah in, 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 in many uh, uh, health uh, uh, magazines and so on, what we really know about the causes of breast cancer, what we knew 30 years ago, 20 years ago, was very little. We only knew about age at first uh, full term pregnancy and about lactation. You know, the earlier the first full term pregnancy, the lower the risk, the more uh, lactation. Uh, period of lactation, the lower the risk. That was uh, done, uh, done by, work done by Harvard the epidemiologists back in the 70s and the 80s. But you know, if we put everything together, we really cannot predict, uh, 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 explain why there are tw something like 20 fold variation from low incidence area to high incidence area. And what is really depressing is that we have not been able, we don't have the slightest idea on how to prevent breast cancer. This is the evolution of breast cancer incidence since the 50s has been going up and only now seems to plateauing. It starts plateauing now after 50 years of dramatic increase. Breast cancer incidence was down here and cervical cancer was historically up there. As an anecdote, I can tell you that there was an Austro-Italian uh, doctor that was working in Verona, Rigoni Stern. Rigoni Stern, in the mid-1850, published an article in which he said, there is something very strange about breast cancer and the cervical cancer, because there is a, a huge community of, um, um, uh, of uh, there were a lot of convents in, in, in Verona, so there was a huge community of sisters. And sister, among sisters, nobody has ever seen a cervical cancer. But there are breast cancers. But in the population in Verona, there are uh, a lot of cervical cancer, and there are no breast cancers. 
Rigonis there 1954. So he argued that sexual life and reproductive life was the possibly the base of these two cancers. Now, everything went into rest because everybody was thinking, thinking which are the chemical carcinogens in the, um, in the environment. You know, there was the Long Island study of trying to find out why there is more breast cancer in Long Island than elsewhere. A huge waste of money. It has nothing to do with any chemical. It has to do with the reproductive factors as we understand it now. Now, prostate is very simple. If you go to Cancer Research UK website in prevention, Cancer Research UK, the equivalent of the American Cancer Society here, says we have nothing to suggest for prevention of prostate cancer, period, is one line, because nothing in no is known about its causes. You can check it. So it, this is where you can say, basically, this, this cannot be chemical carcinogenesis because we have been searching this for 30 years and has to be something more, as we call it, metabolic. So this is my summary of 100 years of cancer epidemiology. So is very, uh, sorry, basics, sorry for the low level of technology, but basically says there are cancers that were very rare 100 years ago have become common. And there are cancers that were very common 100 years ago that have become rare. Cervical cancer has essentially gone down, not because of screening, not because of vaccination, and gone down because of shower, clean water, and soap. Because it's sexually transmitted cancer, the man, as we all know, is the, is the vector, and, uh, and the human papilloma virus is transmitted. Uh, so that essentially has, been, has gone down enormously by the 1950s, almost everywhere in Europe and North America, and is going down everywhere else. Now, obviously, the little bit that is left may be taken care by vaccination and screening. Um, so the question is, and the, this is a, a rhetorical question, is does carcinogenesis require exogenous, exogenous, where the key word is exogenous, carcinogens? Or can we imagine that metabolic processes this can lead to dysregulation of the cell cycle, control of cell cycle, uh, and all the steps that we know, all the checkpoints that were mentioned this morning, such that these endogenous metabolic processes can influence, you know, uh, at the end of the day, whether uh, there is a mutated clone and this mutated clone goes out of control. This is how we are trying to understand the link between obesity and cancer. Now, the big problem is that for until about 20 years ago, most of cancer epidemiology was done by doing case control studies, which in, probably you know exactly what it is, but in a nutshell, you have a group of people who develop cancer, you have cancer patients, and you collect data on these cancer patients, and you identify a group of control who don't have cancer. They may be from population, maybe living in the same area, maybe uh, people with other diseases, and you compare them. This is how the, the, the first discovery were made about lung cancer and smoking, because people with lung cancer say, oh yes, I started smoking 20 years ago, and I smoke a pack a day. And the controls were saying, this smoking was much less frequent in the controls. This is how we discovered about most of the occupational carcinogens has been by doing studies where we have uh, investigated uh, the, the occupational history of cases, of cancer cases, and controls. However, when the focus become metabolic factors, you cannot ask somebody, can you please tell me what was your level of insulin resistance 20 years ago, because nobody knows that. And, and you know, basically, you have to go to a different level of epidemiology in cancer research, which is the biological dimension. And this is where epidemiology that is about population and the research that most of you do that is lab, where we meet, is the point where we started you know, crossing our path in the positive way. I prepared these slides 20 years ago. And I carry it with me because it, 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 it basically says if we want to understand how reproductive life influences breast cancer, how 
Obesity may influence colorectal cancer. We need to follow up people over time before they get the cancer. Start with a large population of healthy people or people who believe to be healthy uh, without a recognized disease. Collect a huge data, and as much data as we can on their lifestyle, and crucially collect blood samples, saliva samples, urine samples, anything that could be non-invasively or easily collected, store the sample, learn about biomarkers of exposure, was very pleased about the previous presentation about fatty acids because I set up a fatty acids lab as an epidemiologist 20 years ago to, do, to use fatty acids as a marker of diet. Um, and actually we have been publishing on fatty acids and, and, and breast cancer, for example, fatty acids and colorectal cancer even, even recently. And, and the complexity that actually the long chain polyunsaturated are generally associated with the reduced cancer risk compared to the uh, uh, saturated, uh, but with the complexity clearly that there are all the elongases and desaturases uh, processes that makes, uh, let's say, the comparison between what we measure in a tissue with what people consume more, much more complex. But, uh, and then we go down to, we follow up people, somebody will get the disease, somebody will not get the disease. And at that point, we will be able to compare the original characteristics. So what's the problem? The problem is that if you want to do a study like this in cancer, a minimum sample size that would give you something reasonable in terms of number of cases is 100,000 people followed up for 10 years. Because cancer seems to be a common disease, but in reality, when you go down to the type of cancer you are interested in, it's a, it's a, it's a combination of rare diseases. Think of a moment, cancer is a combination of rare diseases. It's only breast cancer and maybe lung cancer that have reached the point of, a, uh, of becoming over lifetime common. Uh, now in UK, 10% of women will get breast cancer in their lifetime. Uh, and uh, at the worst case type moment of smoking, about 10% of the men were getting lung cancer in their lifetime. But otherwise, the cumulative incidence of colorectal cancer is 3%. You know, which, which really means we're down to very, very small numbers. So I was very lucky because in the 1980s, 90s, I was working in the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and, uh, and, 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 and the, the scientific council there thought that perhaps we should consider setting up a program on nutrition and cancer. I was doing chemical carcinogenesis, and I was convinced that maybe it was a good, a good idea uh, uh, to, you know, shot in the dark, was actually shot in the dark. And, and the big shot in the dark was how to translate this concept of prospective court into real reality, and to this idea that you need a minimum of 100,000 people. So I designed the European Prospective Investigation on Cancer and Disease, so I tried basically to replicate this concept into reality, which means that for the, in the 90s, we collected data via questionnaire on lifestyle. We took anthropometric measurements. We collected blood and we stored blood. I will show you in a moment. Um, uh, we set up a huge database. And I, little by little, I managed to get a number of collabor collaborating centers in 10 European countries. We set up a follow-up system to make sure that we would be successful, whatever would happen. Uh, all the um, centers were in areas with a population-based cancer registry. So the follow-up is done by record linkage without bothering anybody. Uh, and we get information on cancer. Now we now we have got record linkage for getting cardiovascular diseases, myocardial infarction, type 2 diabetes, and so on. And obviously the link to causes of death. And we have a, a, done a series of regular questionnaires to to monitor the lifestyle evolution of uh, uh, the people. And then with a little bit of patience, you, you do some work. I put 2003 because uh, it, it says that I started in 1990. In 2003, we got the first paper on cancer risk factors that was on, on fiber, I will show you in a moment, and colorectal cancer. So you need to be patient in, 
in this type of research. And they say we set up, was, this was a lot of fun, set up the first large biorepository ever done in, uh, for this type of uh, epidemiological study on cancer and chronic diseases. We stored ten, almost 10 million uh, samples like this, 20, um, 28 samples, uh, straws per, per, per participant. So it's a lot, it's a lot of, was a lot of blood. We store plasma, serum, bafficot, red blood cells. I'll tell you an anecdote. The, uh, the scientific council of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is the IARC, well known in the, United States, in the US for the Roundup story. Right. So that scientific council made by the best scientists in the planet argued for half a day against me that we should not store Buffy code because there was nothing you can do with DNA. <laughs> you know, it was the time of, of Southern blot. They said, you are not going to do Southern blot on half a million people on all possible gene sequences you might be interested in. So why are you wasting money to, uh, to, to, to store DNA? And, and at that moment, we really thought, well, you know, we are only in 1992. Something will come up one day that will be better than Southern Block, isn't it? <laughs> so we have now GWAS on 100,000 people. Um, so this was the end, the results of a, almost a decade of work, collecting data on half a million people, collecting and storing blood sample in 400,000, and covering Europe from the north to south, from areas, you know, with a very different cancer pattern. Uh, for example, prostate cancer incidence is the double up there than in the, in the south down here. But stomach cancer, the highest incidence is in Spain and, and uh, central Italy compared to uh, UK, where, which has the, the lowest incidence of stomach cancer around the planet, whatever you think of British food. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were, I think, was not a, such a bad idea because then over time, uh, many courts have joined in. And 15 years ago, we worked with the NCI to set up the core consortium that now, meets, uh, then now provides a fantastic basis for research with uh, 7 million people followed up all around the world in specific uh, courts. Not all courts have biological samples as we have, but many, most of them. I'm just saying this because go to this website because sometimes you do lab research and you say, oh, it would, fantastic to have, would be fantastic to have biological samples from that particular population with that characteristics. So there, are, there is this network, and this network produces a lot of paper by collaboration. Uh, it's not funded by NCI, it's, it's supported by NCI. Now, I will use, if I have a little bit of time left, yes, 10 minutes. Uh, I say, when you have, once you have all done all of this, uh, how can you go from the, this vague idea that eating fruit and vegetables may be good and eating salted uh, food may be bad? How you go from there to disease mechanism, to etiopathogenesis? Well, this is what we, as a core consortium, I would say, we try to do uh, more and more by combining lab research with epidemiology. And I would just use one example, which is colorectal cancer, and, and to show you how we, so colorectal cancer shows major variations around the world, B big uh, changes in incidence, particularly in Southeast Asia, where it's been going up. It's been tentatively related to diet, lifestyle, environmental factors. And so we started with the simplest idea, like everybody, is diet. You know, it has to be diet. And uh, so we, as I cited before, we estimated that fiber intake, dietary fiber intake, this was our first big uh, coup in a way, because we were the first to show quite clearly, look at the red line, that with increasing consumption of fiber, there is a decreasing risk of developing colorectal cancer. We have done a subsequent analysis, and we have shown that the protection, as predicted by those working on microbioma and, uh, and uh, uh, 
and short chain fatty acids is particularly for colon cancer and much less for rectal cancer, which works somewhat differently. Um, we have uh, later shown that uh, um, consumption of red meat and processed meat, what processed meat means meat preserved by salt, here are associated with a modest but quite significant increase in risk. It's only 40% increase, it's not huge. When I say only 40% is because people who smoke one pack a day have a, uh, have a 40 fold increase in lung cancer risk. So I have a 4,000 eh? 4, percent increase. And we are talking about uh, small variations. And this is the complexity of metabolic uh, carcinogenesis, that there is not a huge factor like smoking. They say, it's there, we can see it. Are many factors combined. So fish is associated with a modest reduction. If you combine red meat and fiber, it's much better to have low modest consumption of red meat and high consumption of fiber because the, if you consume more red meat of less fiber, the risk goes up. This is the risk. I mean, you are all familiar with relative risk. It's a probability where one is the reference group and the rest is, shows that 1.5 means 50% increase the risk of developing colorectal cancer. And, and bad news, we uh, confirmed that uh, uh, alcohol increases colorectal cancer risk, but the good news is that it's only high levels of intake. You, you are probably familiar, 60 grams per day means one bottle of wine per day. So if, if, you, if, you, re, uh, if you remain, if you stay below half a bottle of wine, <laughs> it, sh it should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so that it, it goes well with the, with the, uh, with the Mediterranean diet. Um, however, by combining everything on food and diet, we still were far away from explaining these huge variations around the planet and the huge uh, changes over time of cancer that has gone up like that. And this is why we started thinking that it had to be more complicated. We started looking at adiposity, physical activity, a factor like height. Believe it or not, the taller you are, the taller you are, the higher is your risk of getting colorectal cancer. Or, the taller you are, the higher is your risk of colorectal cancer. <laughs> and I would say of cancer in general, but the taller you are, the lower is the, your risk of cardiovascular diseases. So it's like, a, a, you know, the, these are, there are data on millions of people. Basically, uh, if you put risk of disease with height, uh, for height, cancer goes up, cardiovascular and respiratory go down. We've seen the same everywhere, Europe, North America, Asia, and so on. So it's a complex story about many factors, including growth factors. So now, we started about, as I say, 15, 20 years ago, thinking about metabolic syndrome. The predecessor was syndrome X. At the time, in the late 70s, where syndrome X was people with high cardiovascular risk despite being lean. And these were the people who had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, despite being lean. And we have gone, a little bit a step farther uh, by looking at the components of metabolic syndrome. And first of all, define better what it means obesity for cancer. And so this is, uh, um, this is the risk of getting colorectal cancer for men and for women in their relation to BMI. And that is, is the picture of what was known 10 years ago when the consensus uh, by the American Institute for Cancer Research was that obesity was a risk factor only for men, but not for women. Then we have shown that instead of BMI, you use waste. And then you exclude from the analysis, I'll come back on that, women were taking hormone replacement therapy. If women have abdominal obesity, they have the same risk, they increase the risk they have men. Because that is a, is a very peculiar, the fact that for colorectal cancer and other cancer, the abdominal obesity is by far the driving factor. 
Uh, then we went one step farther and we th thought that how to, how, you know, get a signature of, of uh, insulin secretion. It's nothing very uh, uh, sophisticated today. Uh, but at the same time, in at Harvard, uh, Ed Giovannucci was thinking at insulin resistance and breast cancer, and we were thinking uh, about insulin resistance and colorectal cancer. So I used a study I was collaborating uh, many years ago, that is the New York University Women Health Study, a cohort of 15,000 women. We measure C-peptide, I'm sure you are familiar. C-peptide is a bit, the peptide is part of the insulin molecule that is taken out so that insulin from inactive becomes active and, and, and stays in circulation without having a non-physiological uh, function. And we've seen that the risk of colorectal cancer goes up with C-peptide. We replicated in APIC, we got a, a less, a weaker association, but very, very convincing, basically, the higher is the risk at level of C-peptide measured once in life, the higher is the risk of colorectal cancer over life. And waist circumference, abdominal obesity, and C-peptide are not synonymous. Basically, it, it, what we have found is that for every level of waist circumference, what is really bad is to have high level of C-peptide, so to be definitely insulin resistant. We looked at IGF-1 because it's, it's, it's logic. You, you think at insulin, you look at insulin-like growth factors. And that the results were, let's say, overall suggestive but not convincing that IGF-1 e, e levels are associated with increased risk of colorectal cancer. Probably they are, but there may be a lot of, of imprecision by having only one measurement in life. This is just to show how you can get wrong. And they put back these slides. Uh, because Larry this morning was talking about association and causation. So you can get a lot of associations when you look at metabolic factors that clearly have nothing to do with causation. So if you measure HDL cholesterol and triglyceride, you can think that this is a study on myocardial infarction because this is, this is a, 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 it shows um, in, in EPIC basically shows that the higher the, the level of HDL cholesterol, level one, two, three, four, five, from low level to high level, the risk of colorectal cancer decreases. It goes down to 0 0.6, so 40% decrease. But your triglycerides are higher, your risk goes up by 40%. So basically it says colorectal cancer risk is 40% lower in people with high HDL cholesterol and 40% higher in people with high triglycerides. The, the fact is that there is no known link, biological link, between these markers and colorectal cancer, is that many things travel together in our body, as it happens, and when we go into the metabolic syndrome, we have many biomarkers that move in the same direction. This is why we need to be very careful in working out what is association and what is causation. Uh, so these are two markers I'm showing where I think there is, we're one step closer to causally related links, which is one is adiponectin, it's not very, it's not statically significant, but there is a suggestion that higher level of adiponectin may be associated with a moderately reduced cancer risk is antineoplastic, antiproliferative in experimental work, anti-inflammatory. So as many good things. And on the opposite, leptin is supposed to be bad, but in reality, in our study, was not associated with risk. But what we found to be associated with risk is the soluble, um, um, uh, the, 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 the soluble, uh, um, I got a, uh, uh, receptor that transport uh, in an inactive form leptin. So the more soluble receptor you have, the less bioactive leptin you have. And this is where we found a significant reduced risk in people with a higher level of soluble re uh, receptor. And I will link this in a moment uh, uh, to colorectal cancer more, more directly. Inflammation. Um, in, we haven't really done, we have tried to do um, uh, very sophisticated studies on our samples. 
Yeah, uh, but the problem is uh, that a lot of things get lost with time uh, in, in blood, even in, in liquid nitrogen. So we have, I'm just showing here a C-reactive protein, which is a very generic marker, but it says that people with a higher level of C-reactive protein have a 50% increase in cancer of the colon. And if you use a very generic test, which is the reactive oxygen metabolites marker, of oxidative stress, we find that basically people with higher level of oxidative stress marker in the blood have a, a two-fold increase, which is not non-trivial. Now, this is a, a hyper-simplified attempt to show a way, the way we have, say, collectively think on how you go from the simple dietary factors and the simple, I would say, metabolic factors, obesity, physical activity, the, with a cascade down to angiogenesis and the regulation of apoptosis, and how you can go down here on the line of adipocytes, adiponectin, leptin, and increased cell survival, inflammation. We, we measure interleukins uh, in, in our samples. Uh, the problem is that the current method we have used with Mark Feldman Lab are not sensitive enough for extremely low uh, concentrations. But basically, you get a, a pattern that says there is no chemical carcinogenesis here, it's all metabolic, and this is probably a long-term exposure to this very gentle modification of the control of cell cycle and, 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 and cell reproduction. Um, I just show you one final shot to say not only these factors are important for cancer that people before we, we, we thought that were absolutely unrelated, but thinking about longevity, if we, we have done an exercise in EPIC of combining our information on tobacco, alcohol, BMI, diet, physical activity, blood pressure, based on information that were collected in half a million people. We had about 35,000 people who died by the time we did this analysis. And we looked at whether this, to what extent these factors that we all understand should have something to do with longevity, to what extent this factor have something to do with longevity, and uh, separately for men and women. So we started with what we call the null model, and the null model means we just look at survival from age 40 down to age 75. So this is how half a million people, basically survival probability based on 35 people who died during this period. So it's, um, the, the, the central line is the estimate the little shadow is the confidence interval. Obviously, it's pretty robust. <laughs> now, if we divide men and women by smoking and no smoking, we start seeing something quite interesting. We see that men who never smoked, these are never smokers. Forget about ex-smokers, are not in this, uh, for the moment, in this graph. So these are the people who never smoked, the green lines. And the red are the people who have been smoking consistently since they were in their 20s. So you start seeing that the never smoker, if they were alive at 40, they had a respectable 92% probability of being alive at 70 and 94 for women. When we include all the other factors, having a healthy diet, rich in fruit and vegetables, uh, whole grain cereals, uh, uh, fish, low consumption of red meat and processed meat, and so on. Moderate consumption of alcohol, one or two drinks per day. We excluded the, the never drinkers because uh, in, in Europe are a complicated subgroup. <laughs> the never drinkers have an increased mortality. That's the problem. If you put the never drinkers, which is maybe 10% of the population, you get a, a, a subgroup that is a, is a comp, comp, complex, let's say, to handle. And you take people who are physically active, moderately active, do some physical activity every day in their life, BMI normal, normal blood pressure, 
and, and the, the unhealthy is the opposite. Then what comes out is that both men and women, if they've never smoked and they have all these factors on the green side, if they were alive at age 40, they have 98% probability, or 97, to be alive at age 70, which is spectacular. On, on the opposite, if they were smoking and every, done, got everything wrong on the other factors, men have only 60-something percent probability of being alive, which means they have almost 40 percent probability of dying before age 40. Is huge. Now you may ask why there is a difference between men and women. Well, the difference is that we have taken these some, uh, say, dichotomous almost characteristics. The problem is that if men smoke, they smoke more than women. If men drink, they drink more than women. So if they get a bad diet, they get a, a much worse diet than women. So this difference basically shows the uh, behavioral characteristic of men in Europe that, that of smokers, men smokes in Europe of having a very bad lifestyle compared to women who tend to be more moderate. So this matches estimates that we had done with uh, um, my friend Majid Ezzati, a great researcher in global health, where we basically tried to allocate a 55 million people who die around the world every year to the major causes. And that we cause, call this the causes of the causes. So the causes of the disease that cause the death. So if you do this huge work of taking all the data existing around the planet, what comes out as the number one killer today is high blood pressure. The second is tobacco. The third is high blood glucose, insulin resistance, that cannot be measured at the, popular, at the world's, uh, world scale, physical inactivity, high blood uh, body mass index, high cholesterol, alcohol, low fruit and vegetable consumption. So that roughly explains 72, three quarter of deaths around the planet. We cannot, we're talking about deaths is all wrong because obviously we are going, all going to die. The problem, this should be seen as premature deaths that could you know, be, in a way, postponed. Uh, and, uh, and this is why in our study we call about, uh, we talk about uh, uh, premature uh, mortality. So basically this is a very good news because it says that from, a pub, from coming from research, epidemiology, down to biomarkers, what we find is that we have a huge opportunity nowadays to improve the quality of life, to improve quality of healthy life by working on factors that are largely, theory, in theory, under the control of our society. I'm not saying that it's easy to change this factor, but I'm saying that it's possible to change this factor and probably require a combination of new diagnostic procedure, way to identify people who are at higher risk, working simultaneously at the high risk population and general intervention, the way that was done, for example, for uh, uh, tobacco very successfully in many countries. Thank you for your attention. That was great. Overrun. That was a very exciting talk. We have time for just a couple of questions because we're running over. I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, good talk. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what about the psychological factors in pathology uh, that cause, you know, stress factors that uh, are, are known to cause inflammation, obviously, and may exacerbate many of these conditions here, including high blood pressure, glucose levels, uh, and, and the fact that this is a big factor. It's very hard to obviously monitor and to incorporate into studies, but it's a control factor that I see as a big issue and maybe why studies aren't always reproducible. Any comments on this? Well, thank you for uh, asking this question. When we started this, the studies in two decades ago, uh, and I say we means uh, we in Europe, uh, the Harvard course uh, and, uh, and the American Cancer Society, we all made the same error. 
uh, despite a lot of debate between ourselves, we did not include uh, any ways or questionnaires to measure, uh, uh, I would say, personal well-being, sleep duration, stress, cognitive function was a big error. So we are, cannot use these existing studies to answer that question that you ask, that is a very reasonable question. The good news is that there is a new generation of study, including UK Biobank and the new German court and, and a study we are setting up in Singapore, where we have a very intensive assessment of kind of the social milieu, personal uh, psychological condition, stress, and so on. So possibly, in the near future, we'll be able to address this very important question. I'm going to ask you a moderator question. So given Cindy Sears' finding with juvenile onset colon cancer, are you collecting microbiota samples now? Are you looking at the microbiome? Are you collecting stool? Yeah, so that, that was the other error we made, obviously. We, we almost killed ourselves in discussion of whether we should or should not collect uh, uh, stool samples. Uh, we eventually didn't, and, uh, and also UK Biobank didn't. Um, so we are uh, running late. New studies are doing it. The juvenile, uh, there is this very nice article on uh, GN's General National Cancer Institute a few months ago, maybe last year, showing in the US uh, a, 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 an increasing trend of incidence uh, of colorectal cancer in the generation between age 25, age 40, 39, 40 and which is probably attributable to um, the obesity epidemic, possibly, and maybe to changes in microbiome and so on. So we have an, a, a colorectal cancer that in the US is going down in the people older than 50, essentially thanks to colonoscopy, and the incident is go start going up uh, in the people uh, uh, lower, uh, younger than 40. All right, I'm going to invite people to come up and ask any other questions they have. Thank you for a fantastic session.